and welcome to the Risen Jesus Podcast with Dr. Mike Lacona. Dr. Lacona is Associate Professor of Theology at Houston Baptist University, and he's the president of Risen Jesus, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. My name is Kurt Jarris, your host. Well, we've made it to season six of the podcast here. In the first season, we uh, were introduced to the star of our program. And in season two, we uh, looked at the synoptic problem, which is a common problem in New Testament uh, literature and studies for uh, scholars and laypersons uh, interested in these uh, questions about the New Testament. In our third season, we began to ask the question about the philosophy of history. What is history and how can we know these things from the past? And in the following season, we looked at the historian and miracles. And then last season, we looked into historical sources pertaining to uh, the life of Jesus. Now we are uh, going to spend this season uh, working through the largest chapter of this ginormous mammoth book. And uh, we'll be looking at the, the case of the historical bedrock for the fate of Jesus. And uh, it's going to be an intriguing season for sure. There's a lot of meaty material to go through for those that have read from the book, The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach. And I'm very much looking forward to this season. A lot of good episodes coming up, uh, including today. And so now, uh, lest I continue talking, you're not here to listen to me, but to the star of the program, the Batman to my Robin, as I've uh, sometimes told people, Dr. Mike Lacona himself. Mike, it's great to see you. Well, thanks, Kurt. Good to be back on the podcast again. Yes, it's been uh, several months now, and we were realizing, I think it was probably two months ago, we realized, hey, we need to get together again, and uh, finally your schedule opened up, and so uh, here we are, and I'm very excited. We're back at it and having a lot of fun talking about uh, this material. So the first question I wanted to ask you as we're working through this uh, next chapter in your book thematically is uh, the, the concept of historical bedrock. What is historical bedrock and why is that important when looking at the, the case for the resurrection of Jesus? Well, historical bedrock is somewhat of a, a similar uh, term for what Gary Habermas calls the minimal facts. Minimal facts uh, started off with, with Gary. His minimal facts approach was um, first proposed in his doctoral dissertation back in the 70s. And he said, uh, you know, here are some facts that are granted by the majority of scholars and they are strongly evidenced. Now, some people have misunderstood Gary on this about the minimal facts thinking that we should accept these facts because the majority of scholars grant them. And that's never what Gary said. It's just a matter of um, here are 12 facts that for which the supporting data is so strong that a majority of scholars, including skeptical ones, grant them as facts. So the importance of that, of course, is if you have a skeptic, a non-believer, who grants those facts, you know, they may have biases, but they're not the same bias as a Christian would have, right? So um, it, it's kind of like, look, if both Republicans and Democrats um, it, were in agreement that, um, let's say, that the, the COVID virus came from the Wuhan lab in China, well, then, it, you know, we could have a, a, a pretty good degree of confidence that's the case because both of them, who, who see, they, they don't get along with one another, the Republicans and Democrats. They don't agree on hardly anything. Um, if they agree on this, well, then it's probably true. So if you're looking at both skeptic and believer alike who are willing to grant certain things based on the data, because the data is strong, they think the data is strong, well, that gives you some more confidence that um, that probably is correct. Um, but it doesn't mean it's correct because the majority of scholars take them. When we talk about historical bedrock, it's pretty much the, the same thing. You're saying that the supporting data is very strong for certain facts, and it serves as bedrock for uh, or a foundation upon which hypotheses may be built. So um, if I'm going to say what happened to Jesus, you first have to look at the historical bedrock. What is something— what are some of the facts 
upon which most scholars, the large majority of scholars, a heterogeneous majority of scholars, that is, whether you're looking at evangelical, conservative Christians, moderate Christians, liberal Christians, um, agnostics, atheists, Jewish scholars who are historians of Jesus, if they're all agreeing on these things and they're su citing supporting data, well, that would be historical bedrock upon which you would build a hypothesis. So you could say, all right, well, I grant that the disciples had experiences they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus, and you could, but, but and you would build your hypothesis on that. It, you could say, but they're hallucinations. You're still granting that Jesus died and that the disciples had some sort of experiences. If you're going to say Jesus rose from the dead, you s still would use Jesus' death by crucifixion, and that shortly after his disciples had experiences they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus. You're building your hypotheses upon these this bedrock, the of uh, the historical bedrock, facts that are virtually past doubting. We can have a strong degree of confidence in them. So that's what historical bedrock is. So in, in, in certainly in one sense, it's a practical way of evaluating the hypotheses that historians have for what happened to Jesus. I mean, if we had other facts that we have good reason to believe, uh, but didn't quite seem relevant to that hypothesis, well, that doesn't really help us in this case uh, in appealing to uh, people who may have a different methodology. Is that fair? Yeah, that, that's fair. And of course, I would add that this isn't something that we would apply merely to Jesus or his resurrection. This is something that historians can apply to virtually anything. You've hmm. got to look at um, a collection of facts that are so strongly supported by the data that virtually everyone agrees on them. Um, and, and you do that just to put your own bias in, in check, of course. It's a good thing to do. Of course, you can acknowledge more facts than that. And some things, like there are some scholars who reject the empty tomb and some who grant it. So you can still build a high, you can still add those to your collection of facts uh, that you're going to use for your hypothesis. But I, I would say that if your hypothesis cannot account for some of the historical bedrock, that would seem to suggest that, you know, your, your hypothesis is weak um, and it need, either needs to go back to the drawing board or be discarded. Hmm. So you would say that uh, that we could come to understand the Gospels as historically reliable uh, through a number of methods and analyzing a number of situations, pericopes in the text. We could think that, hey, Luke's generally reliable, but in terms of making a case for bedrock, that's sort of a distinct uh, a method with its own specific purpose, right? Like Habermas wanted to say, hey, what if these skeptical scholars don't grant these things? Can I still make a case? Uh, is that a fair way of describing sort of the, the approach here to studying the Gospels? Yeah, I would say so. The latter part of what you said, it is different from establishing, let's say, the general reliability of the Gospels. Now we're just looking at individual things. And this is something that classicists do. Um, so my friend John Ramsey, who is a retired classics professor at uh, University of Illinois in Chicago, he's, he said to me that uh, pretty much classicists don't talk about the general reliability of an account. So, for example, they wouldn't say that Suetonius' Lives of the Twelve Caesars are historically reliable. They wouldn't say Tacitus' Tacitus's Annals of Rome is historically reliable. What they would do is go to individual stories within Tacitus's Annals of Rome or Suetonius's Lives of the Twelve Caesars or, you know, whatever you're looking at, Sallust's War with Catiline or his histories. Um, and, and you assess each individual story. And um, so that's kind of what we're talking about with historical bedrock here in a sense. But but. But you're, you're getting even more specific because you're saying this particular uh, claim, the claim that, let's say, Jesus died by crucifixion. What's the data for it that supports it? You know, do we have good evidence that Jesus actually died by crucifixion? Well, 
virtually every historian would say yes. So we'd look at the evidence for it. There's all this different evidence for it and say, yeah, that's, uh, that's some pretty good evidence there. Oh, by the way, icing on the cake, virtually every scholar, qualified scholar in the relevant field who studies the subject even grants this as a, as a fact that Jesus died by crucifixion. And so that would qualify as historical bedrock. One of those facts that you're going to use to build a foundation of a hypothesis. Hmm. So yeah, I I keep uh, emphasizing this point because I think there are some that may be confused on the intent of the minimal facts argument and the, the approach here with looking at the historical bedrock. And it's certainly not the case that uh, you think these are the only things that can be known as historical facts in the Gospels, you know, the things we'll be getting into. Uh, but rather, you think that the, the level of certainty is so high here, right? You may think that there are other facts in the Gospels which the certainty is a little lower even, uh, perhaps a little lower than that. There's a spectrum, you might say. And you yourself have gone on the record where you've, you've admitted that you can maybe have some hesitation over uh, a certain passage and the intent of the author there. Uh, and so you really wrestle with these things. And I think that's one of the things that oh, I, I admire you for and others do as well. You're really authentic in your, your search for truth. And, uh, but what you have come to with your research is you've, you've found these other uh, facts of history and then there are these top level tier historical facts that you call bedrock. Uh, now, is that, is that term common in other historical, uh, in, in writings by historians? Do they also use that term bedrock, or is that something that you or Gary have coined? Actually, I heard that term on um, uh, a video by a New Testament scholar named Paula Fredrickson, who is not a believer. She's not a Christian, but uh, she used it in reference to, to um, um, the disciples' experiences, that they had experiences they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus. She says these are uh, belong to historical bedrock, facts that are known beyond doubt. So I thought, wow, that really makes sense. I, I like that term. Um, now, minimal facts uh, has like a, a different, um, at least the way Gary started off with it, it, it has a and, and is commonly used by a apologist, Christian apologist today, has a little different role to it. So it, it, the minimal facts is like, okay, well, I can prove the resurrection of Jesus just using a very small collection of facts. I don't even need a whole lot. Let's just take these that are granted by the majority of scholars. Okay. Um, so you can use that as, let's say, minimal facts as apologetics. But what I was doing here with this, my research uh, historical inquiry into the resurrection was was trying to conduct a, a historical investigation with integrity, acting in the role of a historian, not as an apologist. So I, I'm trying to think through my method very carefully. What is the best kind of method to use here, or at least something that f f with which I can identify and think is a reasonable way of, of approaching history. And um, the historical bedrock upon which you build a foundation just seemed to make a whole lot of sense to me. So I liked Paula Fredrickson's term. I, I don't re recall in my research uh, anyone else using it. Um, but you will find a lot of historians as well as uh, New Testament historians. Um, so general historians, those who are studying, you know, issues outside of religious issues. Um, you, you will find general historians and New Testament historians alike who they may not use the term historical bedrock. You don't find them using the term minimal facts, um, but you'll find them pretty much using the same kind of principle. So I remember, you know, John uh, Meyer, John Meyer, the New Testament historian, John Meyer, I think it was volume one of, of his uh, series, A Marginal Jew, on the historical Jesus. And he talks about, let, let's suppose you put a Jew, an agnostic, and a Christian together in a room. It almost sounds like the beginning of a joke, right? You put a, a Jew, an agnostic, and a Christian in a room, all of them trained historians, and you, and you, you get them to agree on 
you know, talk about the data and agree on a collection of facts that they all can grant because the data is so strong. And he says, whatever those facts are, that is what is what we would call the historical Jesus. It's the Jesus you can prove uh, with uh, a great amount of confidence. So th that's kind of the, the same thing we're talking about here when it was historical bedrock. People just call them different things. I like the term historical bedrock, again, for the reason you, you build a hypothesis upon it. Hmm. Okay, so you've got your bedrock, but then you might have other layers of yeah. facts and, and common facts. And so there's, again, not... Uh, we don't want to push people away from pursuing other... Uh, passages in the Gospels that they might think are historically true and can be useful for an overall case, a larger case for the reliability of the Gospels. Uh, you know, so there are different tactics in apologetics, and uh, this, is, this is one of them. And, you know, Gary, as you said, he started out with, I think it was 12 facts uh, that he said, this is, this is great stuff. And uh, in your book here, you say, uh, uh, sort of quoting him, uh, what if my list were challenged by some skeptical persons, or perhaps we are simply interested in discovering a reduced historical case that could still bear the weight of an investigation of Jesus' resurrection? What would such a case look like? So uh, he gets it down to six, and then I think maybe sometimes he even says, well, even with four or three, you can right. really, really get people uh, to... Uh, to basically realize, hey, the resurrection is the best explanation. And uh, we'll certainly be getting into that next season when weighing hypotheses. So I don't want to jump the gun there. So yeah, as I we... remember when Gary would say, um, you know, go ahead and pick any three or four out, out of these 12. Any three or four. We can do it on any three or four of these. But, you know, his minimal facts argument is, has morphed over time. And now it's kind of like, look, minimal facts – probably resembles more like his, what I would talk about with historical bedrock now. Gary would say, here's, you know, three, four facts that are granted by virtually all because the supporting data is strong. So I don't think Gary and I are, are too far off. Uh, we're pretty much aligned on that kind of method. Um, yeah, so, and, and you're right. There are other things that we can look at. So since writing the book, um, sometimes when I'm, I'm lecturing and even in debates, I'll add that, uh, the earliest claims were they believed that Jesus had been raised physically bodily from the dead. Well, this isn't something that is granted by a consensus of scholars today, a large number, perhaps even a majority. In fact, according to Gary Habermas, the majority today, um, I think he would say, three quarters, perhaps. Maybe, maybe that's a little high. I don't, I don't know. I forgot what he'd be saying now. But more than half would say that they believe Jesus had been raised physically, bodily from the dead. They, that's what they were proclaiming. Some, a lot of skeptical scholars won't agree that that's what they were saying. Um, but I think the, the, the data in support of the disciples claiming that he had been raised physically, bodily from the dead is very strong. So I'll throw that in there and make that part of my case for the resurrection of Jesus, just because I, I don't, even though it's not part of historical bedrock, I think the evidence for it is really strong and I'll throw it in there. So it just depends how I want to argue for the resurrection that particular day. <laughs> so as we look forward to the, the coming weeks and uh, coming episodes here, what, what are, what's a preview of some of these, uh, uh, some of the data in looking for that case for historical bedrock. So what are some issues that we'll be looking at? Well, um, you know, I, I looked at a lot of the literature between 1985 and uh, let's say 2008. Uh, that was pretty much my survey of the literature, a lot of it. And uh, But Gary Habermas has done a whole lot more, uh, 1975 to around the present. So I don't know how many sources I looked at. It was hundreds, um, hundreds and hundreds. I think his bibliography is now over 5,300 academic sources since 1975. Um, some of the facts that I, I'd be looking at would be things, and he would grant them as well, would be things like uh, Jesus' death by crucifixion. That's granted by virtually 100%. I mean, you'll find a few uh, scholars who will either deny Jesus died by crucifixion or call it into question. But you're, it, it's about as rare as hen's teeth to find 
a uh, 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 historian, um, historian of Jesus who would grant that. So Jesus' death by crucifixion. Uh, second, subsequent to Jesus' death, uh, a number of his disciples had experiences they were persuaded were of the risen Jesus who appeared to them. To them. Um, and then third, you had a, a skeptic of the church named Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul, a skeptic who was persecuted in the church, who became a Christian when he had an experience he was persuaded was the risen Jesus appearing to him. Now, those three facts that I gave you right there are granted by virtually 100% of critical scholars uh, in the relevant fields who study this subject. So um, that's pretty strong. And then you have some that are, you know, just not quite there. Strong evidence for it, but you don't have quite, you know, nearly 100% granting them. And that'd be things like the group appearances that the, or some of these experiences occurred within group settings. Um, I think Gary told me uh, somewhere between 75 and 85% of critical scholars grant that. Um, and, and, them saying that Jesus uh, had risen physically, bodily from the dead, being in the original proclamation about his resurrection, that, that's up there as well, but it's nowhere near nearly 100%. So, and there's other things, you know, we can discuss as well, but that's just a, a few of the uh, facts we can regard as historical bedrock. I'm very much looking forward to it, uh, to looking at the the subjects uh, that, that you listed there and more. Uh, like you said, there's even more material that's coming up. I'm looking forward to some great conversations. Mike, thanks so much for, for clearing up the, uh, the the questions over what, what historical bedrock is and uh, talking more about the minimal facts. It's great to uh, clear up and uh, level the field a little bit to see uh, what, where, the, where the truth is with the intent of the minimal facts and uh, to maybe uh, bring some uh, some peace for some people who may be concerned that, you know, it's trying to do too much um, when it's got a specific intent. So I appreciate you clearing that up. And uh, always, it's great to see you and to chat with you. And I look forward to uh, the coming episodes. Thanks, Kurt. This will be fun. If you'd like to learn more about the work and ministry of Dr. Mike Lacona, visit risenjesus.com where you can find authentic answers to genuine questions about the reliability of the Gospels and the resurrection of Jesus. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel. This has been the Risen Jesus Podcast, a ministry of Dr. Mike Lacona. Yeah.